I finished my PhD shortly after that, had sort of like your normal career of being an archaeologist. What does that mean? That meant that I was unemployed for a couple of years, right? <laughs> Hello, you got kids going into archaeology, just remind them of that. <laughs> Finally, I got a job. I, you know, did this. But, you know, come 2003, it was an interesting moment. I, I never forgot about that article, and I heard this interesting news report on the BBC radio. It was this crackly little voice. It was a report from the presidential palace in Kabul. Hamid Karzai, he was a newly appointed interim president in Afghanistan, and he had just arrived in Afghanistan, and he was snooping around the presidential palace, and he went with a group of people, by the way, including Ambassador Jawad, who's in San Francisco today, and they went down into the basement of the presidential palace and they found a series of six boxes labeled from the National Museum. Well, this was reported on the BBC and I heard it and I called Victor and I said, Victor, do you think this could be the six nomadic burials that you had found in Northern Afghanistan in 1978-79 that you hid away all that gold? Do you think that could be it? Well, Victor was kind of busy. He was on his way to Turkmenistan to go do some more digs. So he said, why don't you contact National Geographic? They wrote the article on it. So I got in touch with Geographic and I said, you know, maybe there are some museum boxes. Maybe we can conclude that article, which was sort of a dot, 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 you know, to be concluded article. So they sent me to Afghanistan. I think they thought they were gonna send me for two or three days, you know. Yes or no question, are these boxes you know, do they really include the Bactrian gold? Well, I got there and I met the museum director and, um, oh, this is what happened. I'm sorry, the museum was destroyed. You know, this, this is what archeologists thought, right? We looked at this building where, where all these artifacts are. This is the museum uh, in 1993. It had been taken over by militias. It received a direct bomb. It lost its roof. It lost its windows. You went inside. Look at this. It was absolutely empty. There were no artifacts, right? This is what Victor and I were concerned about when we were writing this report. In fact, it was even worse. They burned all the inventory cards. We didn't know what was there. So when we heard that report in 2003, it was really quite amazing. We thought there was nothing in the museum. To hear that there were museum boxes preserved from the National Museum, that was really amazing. That's what allowed National Geographic to send me to Kabul. Well, all right, back to the story. So here, here's the front page of National Geographic magazine with that article from 1990. And um, so the story continues. I went to Kabul to ask the museum director, what's in these boxes? Here's the museum director. All right, so what did he tell me? He said, all right, Fred, yes, it's true, they did report that there were some museum boxes in the basement of the presidential palace. Then he kind of wrung his hands and he said, well, Fred, you know what? Those boxes are locked and the inventory cards are gone. We don't know what's in the boxes, so why don't you just go away? <laughs> I, I, I really did think this was his, you know, his little story that he was telling me to try to get rid of a young American archeologist. But, you know, as I was leaving the room, he said, wait, wait, don't go. You're a museum curator. I'll make a deal with you. If you promise to do a scientific inventory of these boxes, of anything that's preserved in them, we will open them up for you. Wow, that wasn't amazing. <laughs> I, I, that was completely unexpected. I was expecting to get a yes or no answer, go back to Washington, and in fact, I went back to National Geographic and I said, hey, if we open up, if, if we do a scientific inventory, they'll open these boxes for us. So. To my disbelief, they said, yes, go and do that. And then I realized, how are we going to do a museum inventory in the basement of a bank vault in Kabul? So I went to the National Endowment for Humanities and said, we have to do something. We have to figure out a way how to do inventory in the basement of a bank vault. So National Endowment for Humanities helped me create what we call a mobile inventory lab, basically a museum in a box. And we, we, we put all the pictures that any object that might have been in the Kabul Museum, anything that we had from books, from catalogs, we put it on laptop computers, we got battery operated scanners, we put all these things in bags, and I went to Kabul 
and it sounded like we were ready to start this inventory. In fact, I even invited the senior vice president of National Geographic to come with us for the inventory, and we got there, and we waited. <laughs> That's me with the executive vice president of National Geographic. What are we doing? We're sitting in front of the bank vault waiting, because guess what? Mr. Masudi, the museum director, he wasn't kidding when he said the boxes were lost, I mean the boxes were locked and, and the keys were lost. We had to get a presidential decree so that these boxes could be opened. So we waited and waited and waited and finally in April of 2004, they gave us the decree. They said, all right, you can open them up. Well, here we are. In the center of the picture, there's the Minister of Culture of Afghanistan. He's extremely excited about this. Next to him is Victor Sarinidi, uh, a little bit grayer, a little bit older. I actually had to bring him from his excavations in Turkmenistan to come down. And there, in the front of the picture, you see a guy with a circular saw and all the sparks going there. And I'm in the back, and my expression isn't that happy as you see. You know, I, there were two things going through my mind, right? I said, Oh my goodness, that saw is pretty hot. Either we're going to find a puddle of gold at the bottom, or, you know, option two, we're going to find that the safe is empty and there's a little note in there saying, haha, we got here first. <laughs> but that's not what happened. We opened the box and there was the gold. It was amazing. It was amazing to see these little plastic bags that had all the jewels from the Bactrian gold. This was Victor's treasure that he found in 1970-79. It hadn't been stolen. It hadn't been melted down. It hadn't been destroyed when the museum was destroyed. It was amazing. And then Victor pulled me aside and he said, uh, Fred, remember that inventory from 1979? He said, you know, we counted all 21,000 pieces of gold. He said, I'm not gonna do that again. This is your project now. <laughs> and he went back to Turkmenistan. So before he did that, actually he gave us a gift that I will never ever forget and you will see down in the exhibition. It's absolutely amazing. He gave us the original field documents from when he excavated. And these tombs that he had found were absolutely intact. These are the drawings that he had made of the individual burials. As you see, all of the beads and all the jewelry and all the weapons are exactly in place, which allow us to create pictures of what people along the Silk Road looked like 2,000 years ago. Our first picture of people at the center of the Silk Road. Now I'm going to show you a few pictures of objects. You're going to have a chance to go downstairs and see the objects, or maybe you've already seen them. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little taste test of what's down there and what we found in these boxes. For example, one of the big surprises was these objects that were a mixture of art styles this is a classical Aphrodite statue, little, uh, little figurine. You see it in burial six. I'm going to show you a few objects from one burial, burial number six. Um, princess, this is the brooch that she wore right at her chest. And it's an Aphrodite, absolutely classical, except look at her forehead. There's a little Indian beauty mark, just typical of this art from northern Afghanistan. True Silk Road art. They're mixing Indian styles and classical styles all on one single object. You know, we came to understand a little about, about who these people were. They were nomads. They were carrying their wealth with them. Downstairs you'll see these anklets. They're not bracelets, they were worn on the feet. The, each of these are made of solid gold. You know what this is, actually? This is the nomadic banking system. They didn't have houses, they didn't have banks, they were carrying all the wealth with them. This is what they wore during daily life. Look at the artistry of these objects, they're absolutely incredible. These objects have artistic motifs from east and west. Here's a series of hair pendants called the Dragon Master, typical of the ancient Near East. But the gold is local Afghan gold, and look, there are stones on them, garnets, the dark red stone, and the light bluish green stone is turquoise, all locally found in northern Afghanistan and Iran. Absolutely unclear evidence that these objects were not stolen or, or, or robbed from the caravans, but they were being made in northern Afghanistan for these nomads.